Thank you for the introduction. Um, welcome everybody to Vienna, even if slightly wet. I hope everybody made it roughly all right and uh, is staying safe out there. Now, my colleague Mario Linz and myself, René Meyerhofer, we are from Johannes Kepler University in Linz, so we are kind of local. Normally, it would only have been a one hour 15 train ride. Yesterday, it took slightly longer by car to get here. But um, we, it is our honor, it's our pleasure to have been invited here to talk a little bit about what we have been doing over summer or before summer to try and dig into EXET. Now, you might want to ask, why and why should you care? What is XSET? What are the XSET utils? What is libLZMA? Um, if you haven't really used it explicitly, for example, with tar as a compressor, com uncompressor, decompressor, you may not have been exposed to XSET before. So why should we care about a kind of small, obscure packer if you're not using it explicitly? Well. There is an open source project, so we are talking about open source here. There is a GitHub um, repository, there is a GitHub page now, previously it was hosted somewhere else. And again, if you haven't really used it explicitly, you may not have seen those repositories. And then it uh, came to media attention. Why was that? Uh, because XSET has a very large reverse dependency tree. You may not have heard of it before, but you have used it implicitly in many different places. If you do a, a really quick run of what is what is the reverse dependency tree of those packages, libl-setma5, which is the library implementing the XSET compression decompression, it's here on the top line. You can see that it's in nearly 30,000 packages on current Debian or Ubuntu. That's a lot. So this thing is implicitly or um, explicitly, so maybe even through transitive dependencies in a lot of packages. It's pretty much on par of some of the other packer libraries like uh, bset2 or libset standard one, which has seen some more interest after that xset attack came to light. But I was also interested in how does it compare to others. So for example, curl. I mean, there's the saying curl is everywhere, right? Yes, curl is being used in too many shell scripts, but the actual lib curl is only in about a third of all the dependencies that libLZMA is in. Or stuff like SSH or JPEX. I mean, JPEX is a complex, kind of complex image format. How often is that used? In about, um, sorry, um, lib curl is in about a tenth of all the dependencies, lib JPEG in about a third of the packages that libLZMA is in. And how does it compare to other libraries that we use? Uh, well, libc6 lib is not that far off, quantitative, quantitatively speaking. So libLZMA is, you could say, pretty much everywhere. Now, why did we start to look at that? Because it is also used indirectly in OpenSSH. Funnily enough, OpenSSH doesn't use it directly in upstream, but some distributions, some Linux dist distributions patch the OpenSSH source code to use libsystemd, and libsystemd depends on libLZMA, so there you are. Now, why did we actually shine our light on that library? Because somebody, Andres Freund, noticed that his open SSH logins on the server side took slightly longer than usually. There was some monitoring in place and he started digging and this is where we ended up in. It's not only in SSH, but in stuff like the Linux kernel. I mean, to be fair, this is not the exact same source code. It's what's called XSET embedded, but the same unpacking code is also used in the kernel itself and many other packages that you may have heard of that have quite an attack surface in the sense of open network ports or Tor, Firefox, etc. All those packages directly link or directly or indirectly link to libLZMA. So how did we get there? How did we get something into an attack into SSH, one of the probably cl most closely monitored open source packages out there. It's not easy to slip something in there because many people are looking into what goes into open SSH. It wasn't the SSH directly being attacked, but it was the so-called supply chain. And this is the main topic of today's talk, that we tried to identify what were the critical steps in this attack path. 
tried to identify what was necessary to pull this attack off and um, to round it off towards the end of the talk, what we, what we can actually learn from this part. So just caveat, this is not a talk about the details, about the actual exploit, about the real injected backdoor. There have been other talks in the last uh, month or two that have done a great job in doing that. We are, this is not in our scope. We are trying to generalize. We're going to a more abstract level, trying to learn how this was pulled off from the, you could say, organizational or structural perspective. And for this, we look at five different stages. For stage one, over to my colleague. Yeah, uh, hello and good morning also from my side. Yeah, and I will start with stage one, building trust. Imagine you're an open source developer working with passion on your source code and suddenly on some day your project gets integrated into a widely distributed system like Debian. And that is something that is I think, I guess that this must feel like there is a lot of responsibility that comes with that if your project gets integrated into such huge systems. And this is something very similar that happens to Lassie Collin. And Lassie Collin was the original and responsible maintainer of the XSET uh, project that we are talking today. Um, and one of the first interesting aspects that I would like to start with is uh, that the XSET uh, case didn't begin with kind of fancy hacking tools or, or sophisticated code. It's, it all started with social engineering, a tactic that preys on humans, emotions, trust, and also pressure. And pressure is very important for today's talk that I will slightly highlight uh, within the first building block that I, we have prepared here. Um, yeah, and we want, I want to start with the stage one, building trust. And this is about the social engineering tactics that the attacker used to exploit trust within the open source community. And this is very, very um, in interesting and important essential for the attacker to be successful in the end. Let's start with the first commit. So we have identified uh, one of the first commit we have detected was by a, a GitHub user called GRT75. This was not a very specific commit, but uh, we detected that one. Um, the, the user itself seems very friendly. At the first place, the user seems very friendly, very supportive, very, a very valuable user actually for the project itself, for the open source project. Uh, and later, uh, we find out that the user has other intentions with this open source project. Um, and one thing that maybe is also important for the further um, presentation slides, this user is named Chia Tan, and this uh, uh, username GRT75. The first commit was not very special, but suspicious, I would say. So the user replaced a safe fprintf function with an fprintf function. Hmm. We don't know yet why this was done by this user, but it is kind of suspicious, right? So uh, currently we are not aware if this one is really relevant for the final attack that the user uh, tried to do but uh, it is a suspicious, suspicious uh, one, and so we should maybe focus on that. But that was on November 2021. Afterwards, everything started with this patch. So we had a, a patch via mailing list in April 2022 uh, by this user, Jia Tan, the attacker, uh, and there the social engineering stage actually started. So the first thing, uh, there was a, another user involved, Chigar, Chigar Kumar, um, and this user um, replied on this uh, patch via mailing list by that this is a quality of life feature uh, and this will unfortunately take years until the community actually gets this. So this is kind of setting up pressure on the original maintainer. Then uh, Chia Tan, the attacker, the friendly attacker, the very valuable and supportive attacker, tried to, to, to slow down the, the pressure and so on. Uh, makes the statement that the contributors to the projects are hobbyists, so we, we have to take uh, care about their resources and so on. Maybe we should also talk within this community, within this round about that topic, uh, so the open source developer doesn't have 40 plus hours a week for fast releases and high quality. So, so this is more a supportive statement to build up trust within this project. Then I've summarized some more um, statements from different users. So for instance, patches uh, spent years on this mailing list, uh, mailing list over m one month and no closer to being merged. Um, is there any progress on this? Very interesting, the last sentence, 
why can't you commit this yourself? And this was the first sign that, that the goal of the attacker was to get commit permissions on this open source repository. Then, in the meantime, this was in May 2022, there is another patch, uh, another um, um, yeah, thread ongoing, but this was for the project XZ for Java, so a different one, and a new user called Dennis Enz. And this uh, user also started to put more pressure on the original maintainer, even within another project. Um, then, in May 2022, uh, we saw the first signs of being overwhelmed by the original maintainer, by the responsible maintainer, Leslie Collin. He, for instance, stated that he has a lot of unanswered emails at the moment, and obviously he knows that that isn't a good thing, right? So these are the first signs of being overwhelmed by a small open source developer with a lot of responsibility as this project is involved in. Uh, widely distributed systems. And then we see that uh, Leslie Collin mentioned the first time the attacker user Chia Tan. So, and he mentioned that he might play a bigger role in future, uh, then he, and also that Chia Tan is very supportive and he, he builds up a, a certain trust relationship to that user. I don't know if they met, I don't think so, but there is a, at this point there is a specific trust relation to a user that contributes to the open source project. And the attacker's goal, this was quite clear, um, that Chigar Kumar also wants to force that there should be a new maintainer for this project. And he also put additional pressure on that, that progress will not happen, very, very frustrating and so on, until there is a new maintainer. And then uh, we have another pressure, uh, why wait until the new version to change maintainer? Why delay what your repo needs? So this is just more putting more social engineering pressure uh, on the original maintainer. Uh, we also see from Dennis Enz, from the other user that we have seen for XZ for Java, that he mentioned why not pass maintainership. So it's getting clear what the attackers try to do. And finally, also the attackers get what they want. So I'm talking here about attacker with parenthesis S because we are not aware if it is a single user but, or multiple or a group of users or whatever, uh, but we, uh, yeah, we think that it, it might be more users because it was a very sophisticated and resource intensive uh, attack that we have seen here with um, X8. And, <coughs> sorry. and finally the attackers got what they want. Uh, because uh, Leslie Collin, the original maintainer of the project, mentioned that Gia Tan have a bigger role in the future and that he is practically already a co-maintainer of the project. And we have seen the first signs with that. So in the, in the beginning of December 2022, this was very, uh, very uh, critical um, time frame. In the beginning, we see here that the user Gia T75 authored the commits, but but the commits themselves were only committed by Lar HZU, that was the original maintainer, Leslie Collin, but never committed directly by the attacker. And if we see uh, the Git history um, in the end of December, so December the 30th, uh, 30th of 2022, we see the first time that the attacker GRT75 committed on himself. And that was the point in time where the attacker were successful, they got the permissions to directly commit to the repository. Now with that building trust exercise gone and um, caveat here, we assume that most of those accounts, all of those accounts probably were really sock puppet user accounts controlled by a well-organized attacker. Um, who's behind there? There are some suspicions, but as far as we are aware, there's no proof of who really pulled this off. All we can say is that all the um, elements point to this being a coordinated and very well executed attack, starting with that trust exercise. Now, stage two. After, through that building trust stage, having succeeded in getting direct commit access to the repository, the attacker started with a few steps that we frame as preparation steps. Preparation because they already are necessary steps for the attack that followed later on. And if you, if you 
just zoom back a little to the timeline. This was over two years ago that uh, this exercise started. So this was a long game for the attackers. That those preparation steps are required critical path steps in the chain that we've identified, but they in themselves are still what we see as deniable. All those steps in the preparation stage could have had some really benign reason behind them and are not directly connected with the actual attack being pulled off, but they are required for the attack to work in the end. So first stage was another open source project. You may have heard of Google's OSS Fuzz that uh, tries to find bugs through fuzzing in a quite large number of open source projects. And the first step here in the preparation was for the attacker to change the primary contact role for Google's OSS fuzz to their email address to be able to make some, like you could say, config changes for how Google's OSS fuzz um, was used to fuzz, to f try to find bugs in this X set in the libl set image. Through that contact change that was being requested and was being approved because it's kind of a normal thing if there's a maintainer changeover going on that contacts at other projects for this project are being changed. So this was kind of non-suspicious event uh, if looked at it in an isolated way. Second step, another user called Hans Jensen, again, we assume this is another sock puppet account of the attacker, is introducing a change to Xset, which is introducing iFunk. iFunk is really a dynamic function resolver um, method that can be used to dynamically resolve, to dynamically replace basically function calls during the loading stage of some program, of, of whatever is using that library. And this is in itself also a benign change, even though for a small project with like libLZMA, one could ask, why do we actually have to use iFunk? It just replaced function resolver for some very simplistic use cases where standard C function pointers were used before. And now somebody proposes to introduce this complex, generic abstract resolver infrastructure into that library. In itself, it's not an attack, but it's required for the for the additional stages and could already be a bit of a signal that I call introducing code and structural complexity into a project that might make it more likely to be attacked in the future. But again, in itself, completely deniable, this change in, it, in its own is not an attack. The code change is very small, as you see, just replacing a function pointer by that iFunk um, attribute to use that generic resolver infrastructure. And with that, going back to the first preparation step, actually um, disabling certain fuzzing, specifically the iFunk fuzzing on Google's OSS fuzz for that project with the reason that this is uh, that a recently introduced iFunk change is not compatible with the way that Fuzzer works at the moment, so let's disable it. Again, you could argue it deniable because it was actually documented at the point that iFunk is compatible with this kind of fuzzing. So yeah, the obvious uh, easy way out is to just disable it. But again, it probably, we don't know that for sure, but it probably helped the attackers not being detected uh, sooner. We are not completely certain about that. So there, I don't have any, uh, any signals that Google's OSS fuzz would have detected that injected backdoor otherwise, but it, again, a slightly suspicious change. But all of that's so far deniable. Now, uh, this was because of that contact change before and because of the contributions to the upstream repository by that same user before, this was automatically flagged for ready to merge in the other project in Google's OSS fuzz and was then uh, manually committed to be merged. And now we move away from the deniable stage into the actual attack. Okay, uh, yeah, in this stage, the inject vector stage, we want brief, we have extracted a brief portion of the attack itself because it's highly sophisticated and has, has a lot of parts, but we should be kind of a little bit familiar with some of the attack uh, patterns that the attacker uh, really used in that case. Um, and we have prepared one example. We have also prepared one slide with a lot of sources on it, very valuable sources, because a lot of other people's already analyzed this attack on different layers uh, of depth uh, towards the machine and uh, the system. Uh, and you can look at the details up if you uh, are interested in. So it all started, the injecting stage started with injecting the backdoor by 
by uh, adding hidden, uh, um, so the backdoor was hidden in test files that has been added to the repository. And we have two important test files here in that particular case. We have the bad free corrupt LZMA test file and we have a good large compressed uh, test file. And that uh, actually are binary blobs that they are added to perform certain tests and so on. And in there, the attacker Chia Tang, on the top you can see the name again, uh, introduced the hidden vector. And another change that was quite suspicious and interesting, the attacker added the build to host.m4 file to the git ignore file. Hmm. That was quite strange because why should the attacker do that? And the reason was because in the build to host.m4 file, this file is used on the build server where the package get as gets assembled and built um, to, to, to start the configure stage. And this file was added to the git ignore because the attacker doesn't want it to be part of the repository where everybody could have a look on it uh, and could maybe reveal the hidden vector in there. Uh, and I've we have just extracted one specific command that uh, have been detected in this build to host a .m4 file. And this, in the first place, I would say this looks not suspicious. It looks a little bit weird. It was not written very readable, I guess. I don't know, but it's not suspicious in a way so that I would immediately detect that there is something malicious going on with this line, right? So and. Maybe we should just go today through this command and see what the attacker were able to do with that. Start, let's start with the first variable, the glam config make variable. This was also defined in the build to host.m4 file uh, and includes or started a, a specific grab command with some specific string and whatever uh, to the source directory and in the end we can, I've already prepared, also prepared a small test environment where I've simulated the real um, uh, document uh, hierarchy that was also in the project. And if we run this grab command in this document, we see that the, um, that the bad free corrupt LZMA directory gets extracted from there. And if we substitute this variable in the command before, uh, we see now a set command um, calling this uh, bad free corrupt test file, then piping it into another variable that we've called with aval, uh, and we have a, a third one, the gl prefix variable. So in what, what is about this strange set command? This looks quite strange. Maybe does anybody know in here what this set command could do? So just from looking at it, at it what do you think is this set command used for? It's not a very common one, right? Sorry? I Stream editor? Stream editor? Uh, no? So, so the R uh, is for reading a file. Maybe this helps you. So set reading from file, and what does it mean with backslash n? What is the attacker trying to do here? Sorry? Yes, exactly, exactly. This was, this was the intention, because if you call set with an R, read from file, and file backslash n doesn't exist, of course. And then this, what, what is set doing then? Set is just uh, printing out the output what is part of the file. So actually, I would say that set is a, a hidden cat command. And if we try that in the console, we should see exactly the same output as we would see if we just use cat. So it's, it was just kind of an obfuscation so that's not very easy for the, for the users, for the reviewers to detect what the attackers is trying to do here. Okay, then we substitute this strange weird set command uh, again within our obfuscated whole command. And then we start with the next variable, the GL path map variable that gets called via eval. And this variable includes kind of a TR command that replaces some dashes with underscores and, and vice versa. And if we do that again in our test environment, 
we see that the attacker, so I've just echoed one command, test minus one, two, three, underscore, and if we uh, pipe it into the TR command, we see that the, the dashes gets replaced with the underscores and vice versa. And this was used by the attacker to actually uncorrupt uh, the, the content of the test file, because before it was the bad, free, corrupt, whatever test file, it has to be corrupted by intention, because it was a test file to test if the, if the exact uh, tool is properly handling corrupted files. And with that one, we uncor the attacker uncorrupted it so that it ha makes sense again. So it, the syntax is, is properly defined afterwards. Um, the last variable, the third one, uh, we have seen in the command before is the gl prefix command. And this one echoes the variable gl config make that we have seen before in the first place and pipes it into another set command. Um, I've, in the second line, I've just substituted the variable gl am config make uh, with the original uh, path to this uh, test file. And if we run that in our test environment, that was also quite interesting uh, because the attacker used the, the file extension of this test file, the XZ test file, piped it into the set to extract just the XZ that is used as a command uh, before in the, in the complete obfuscated command pattern that uh, you have seen before. And finally, this was the whole command. This is the this was the obfuscated command hidden by the attacker in this uh, build to host.m4 file and that is just cats, uh, so it, it, it reads the input, uh, the content of the file, uh, of the test file, it uncorrupts the test file with the tr command, and finally it, it pipes it into the xz command. And I have to also add something that is not in the slide because it was on a later stage. Afterwards it gets again piped into a shell and, and get, got executed on the build host on the machine on the, for the, on the package mach maintainer machine where the package actually gets assembled and built and distributed afterwards to its users. Um, I have pre uh, we have prepared a, a small uh, illustration about the, with the remaining steps just to quickly go through it, but there are a lot of sophisticated and very detailed steps in between and you can look it up on the sources that I will provide you on the, on the next slide. So we are here on the build to host file. We are in the context of the configure autoconf on the build machine uh, has been used in that particular case. This extracts the malicious script that we have seen before from the test file, from the corrupt test file. And this one extracts additional scripts that were hidden in the other test file, that good large compress test file. This was rather big because the name implies it's a good large test file to test the capability of the exact utils to handle large files. And there the attacker also uh, hides a lot of uh, malicious scripts in there to, to, to uh, make this uh, attack happen. And finally, this uh, good large compressed LCMA file also manipulates the make file itself. So now we are in another context, the make context, actually building the, 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 the library. And there the bad free corrupt file got, uh, got evaluated or let's say repaired uh, another time, but in a different way. So there are other bit shifting operators, so very sophisticated. And finally, the attacker with the make file manipulated the source code of a C file, the CRC64 underscore fast.c file. And that uh, contained uh, a function, CRC64 resolve, calling a get CPU ID um, uh, function. And that one was the part where the ifunc resolver pointed to the, finally on the, on the victim machine, pointed to the uh, malicious function provided by the attacker. And that was the goal. And finally, uh, the libLZMA library contained a malicious object file called libLZMA. Here, as uh, promised, uh, we have some sources listed here. Uh, we have also read the research, um, the, the research work from Russ Cox uh, on the exet script, a very detailed one you can have a look on. I would really recommend that one. Also, uh, really nice to recommend is the speaker deck, the second link. Uh, it has been some days ago, I guess, on, on DEF CON, a talk by, by uh, the user Frogger. It's also very detailed on the attack paths, and so you might want to have a look on that as well. 
Uh, stage four, I briefly make the stage as well. Uh, deployment, uh, this was just about how to get this deployed to the, to the end users, to the victims. Um, and we have compared the releases on the GitHub repository page. Uh, if we compare the malicious release, that was one of them was 5.6.0, the other one was 6.1. But if we compare that one, where the attacker only placed the source code there to a previous one that wasn't malicious, where the attacker also placed the other tar uh, files in the Git repository, we immediately saw, see that the attacker doesn't want the complete binary to be shipped to the uh, victim. The attacker wants that the source code gets built on the machine. So that was my intention. And that's also interesting because at that point where the, where the attacker is able to compromise the build um, steps that are executed on a build machine, that's quite uh, um, critical because a remote code execution would there be possible as well, right? Because the attacker were able to extract a script, um, a shell script from a, from a binary blob, that was also a problem, binary blobs there, uh, that, that got executed on the build machine itself. Maybe also one topic that we would like to discuss afterwards. Um, afterwards, it was quite easy. We have again another sock pop puppet account, Hans Janssen. Maybe you can remember that from the first stage where we tried to um, have a look on the social engineering tactics. Hans Janssen started to looking for a sponsor uh, at Debian. Uh, and finally, another uh, push from Another attacker we don't know yet, but it has also a proton mail. So maybe uh, it's all because other sock puppets accounts also use a proton mail and Gmail, and so they, they, they used a mix of email addresses or email providers. And this user also tried to put additional pressure. So again, with again the social engineering tactics to the um, maintainer, to the upstream maintainer, um, that they should really publish this package uh, to the community. Okay, now we are exploitation. Now, two years later, two years after the attack was starting to be prepared, um, the attacker was ready to move into exploitation. That exploitation, that is the final stage after having succeeded in getting that code. Again, um, just a small reminder, this actually constituted remote code execution to that point on the build environment, on the build hosts. If those were not properly isolated, much more could have gone wrong there. Like, for example, trying to, let's say, exfiltrate the package signing keys or other stuff from the build hosts, if not well isolated on the build infrastructure. That wasn't used in this attack, but it would have been a possibility at that point. Now, what was the attacker doing here? Having succeeded in getting the Trojanized lib LZMA into Red Hat and Debian unstable versions, basically. The OpenSSH daemon was in that first exploitation stage, the first target of this complex attack. We have some indication because the an, a second version of that attack script that we, we walked just through a few choice bits and pieces of that attack script. It's very complicated. It, it gets executed twice, etc., etc. It has some debugging, it has some hooking methods in there to easily extend what is being edited during the build process with additional uh, build, uh, additional test files in the future, so it actually had some extensibility built in for other attacks. But the first attack, and we were very lucky to, call, to have caught this one um, at the start, was towards the OpenSSH daemon. As already mentioned before, some distributions, particularly the Debian, Red Hat, uh, Fedora universes, patch OpenSSH to include libsystemd, that includes lib LZMA, and through that ifunc dynamic resolving infrastructure, upon loading the OpenSSH daemon, that uh, dynamically replaces um, a few functions, for example, one of them, the RSA public decrypt. Again, um, another deep dive could be warranted there. This is a whole other talk on how this attack works that we're not going through here. It is not in scope. Just choice bits when um, the attacker connects to such an open SSH server that loads a trojanized libLZMA. So 
Remember, the OpenSSH daemon is unmodified. It just loads the modified library. That unmodified OpenSSH daemon is injected a function to if the client tries to authenticate with an RSA public key, that RSA public key decryption is actually used to inject commands into the OpenSSH server through that function overload through the generic iFunk uh, resolving function. That gives the attacker capabilities like complete remote code execution on that OpenSSH server, uh, just simply bypassing all the authentication on that system and basically owning that machine if OpenSSH, as it usually does, runs as root. Funnily enough, the attacker even tried for that old nobus, the nobody but us thing, because their commands need to be signed with an add uh, private key that supposedly only the attacker knows and where the public key was um, attached within that Trojan Isolate Bell CDMA. So there was even some authentication of the attacker going on there. But it's still an unauthenticated remote code execution from the point of view of the authentication that the machine actually wants to do there. Now, again, not deep diving into that one, but what, what you can see in those multiple stages is this was a very complex, very, very well executed attack consisting of multiple stages. We assume that the attackers, probably plural, um, are really professional in what they do because as far as we can see so far, they didn't make a single operational uh, mistake in trying to re in, in getting their identity actually revealed. There was one mistake, so the uh, shell scripts that are embedded obfuscated embedded into those text files, they seemingly had a bug before because there was another upload. They had to fix a bug and fix the test files in the repository to make them actually run. But it was only a single replacement. There were no other mistakes made during that attack that we are aware of. It was really well executed and will be textbook material in our university lectures for years to come. Now, what can we take from that? Those five stages, complex attack, really good learning experience, but what can we actually take as takeaways on the generic level? We've tried to come up with three parts of the attack chain where we can see some signals, and this is hopefully something for other open source projects to learn from. So look for signals of social engineering somebody building time pressure, building social pressure, the fear of not keeping up with changes, etc. This could be a signal for malicious behavior if that pressure is being built up, if that pressure is being kept on. Then signals for what we call bug doors. So bugs that are actually backdoors, but that have some deniability, some obfuscation built into them where somebody could say that, oh, sorry, honest mistake, but it, ten it turns out to be a backdoor, it turns out to be exploitable on um, intention. What signals do we have for that? I would say any structural or code complexity that is being introduced and maybe unnecessarily being introduced. If there is a patch coming into an open source project that introduces complexity for no immediate gain, uh, please take a double look at that one because complexity is always the enemy of security and this was one critical stage in that whole attack path that introducing the iFunk generic resolver infrastructure was critical and this was actually not required on the face of it and it could be a signal. Or also disabling fuzzers, disabling other security mitigations in the continuous integration pipeline could be a signal for malicious behavior. And finally, anything that's hiding or obfuscating is probably a very clear signal for malicious behavior. Unfortunately, one of those that is hardest to detect because binary blobs in uh, source repositories, we have that all the time for various different reasons. Chipset drivers, some opaque blobs that are required to drive some hardware, some test routines, test vectors for uh, cryptography, for parsing file formats. We have binary blobs all over the place. So these are not in themselves um, a signal on its own. But Weird encodings, dodgy shell manipulation tricks, yes, if you spot them, they are good signals for some malicious behavior going on, but 
Can you spot that, that line that we saw, that one small deep dive line that we take? Just me looking immediately at that line, if I'm already a small um, open source project maintainer being overloaded, I probably wouldn't have spotted that. And one person's weird encoding or dodgy manipulation is another person's, hey, this is normal, this is how I typically do things. This is very subjective. So what is hiding, what is obfuscating behavior is subjective. There is no clear metric on how you detect it. So how do we start to look for those signals for other potential malicious behavior in other open source projects? We have a lot of open source projects out there. It's kind of hard to look at all of them. We don't have the person power to do that. So our one call for action that we would like to point uh, the community towards is how, to pre how do we prioritize? What is major, maybe a major to do, which packages do we look at? And we suggest starting to look at other packages of this kind of niche. And what I call niche here is a small open source project with a very large reverse dependency tree. So a very small project being used basically wherever. Plus, additionally, it helps for an attacker if that project deals with parsing complex data formats, because parsing complex data formats, you have some test vectors in there, you have some weird binary blobs in there, you have some parsing logic in C or C++ memory unsafe languages that can probably easily uh, swallow some bug doors that the attacker can use as backdoors to exploit. So if you see that combination in a project, small project, large dependency tree, and dealing with complex data formats, those are, I think, high priority targets at this point to look at and to see if we can see any other malicious signals in there. But this is like the start. This is what I would see as the most high priority ones because we take the learnings from that case that this is probably um, nice projects to easily hide attacks in. We have to assume other attacks are going on at this point. We just caught that one. But there are many other projects out there that would be equally well suited for this kind of attack. Now, how can we mitigate? How can we make it not happen in the future? The obvious thing is that if we have identified five critical stages, then break any one of those stages and you break the attack, which is true. But if you break one stage, attackers might find another workaround to do the same thing, to try the same thing, but with a slightly different version of how they do it. So as defenders, let's please try to break as many of those stages as we can and make the attacker's life really a lot harder. One thing is, of course, please use memory saver languages, use type safety. This, fair enough, this wouldn't actually have helped a lot in this particular case. It wasn't a C memory safety issue here at all. It was a supply uh, chain attack. But generally, it's harder to hide bug doors, to hide something as, sorry, benign mistake, which is then actually a back door in a memory safe language than it is in a memory unsafe language or one with a strong type system. It's also harder to hide those bugs. So let's please do that. But much more important when it comes to those complex stages is to use a safer build system. What do I mean with safer build system? A, reproducibility. Make stuff binary reproducible if all those build hosts would have taken the same source checkout and reproduced bit for bit, exactly the same library, independently of the build host being executed on, this would very likely have been caught much earlier. So let's use build systems that are reproducible. Let's also use build systems that are declarative because quite a number of those attack stages hinged on the fact that you could do willy-nilly whatever arbitrary shell code execution as parts of the various build system stages. As the during the dependency resolution, during the actual make stage, there were just shell script executions as standard uh, cores in automake, autoconf, in make files, etc. If we can get rid of those build systems and make them just declarative of specifying what the dependencies are, what the build arguments are, that attack would just simply break. This attack path wouldn't be possible. So using declarative build systems that are reproducible that don't, don't have any preprocessor, any side effects. So for example, Cargo's, uh, uh, Rust's Cargo without the build RS, so throw away the build RS, then Cargo is declarative and kind of safe. That would be a real step uh, forwards for the supply chain security. If you have a continuous integration build chain, GitHub Actions, etc., 
don't disable fuzzers, like make it impossible to disable the security mitigations, make it impossible to disable fuzzers. Of course, we know for a fact that peer review of code commits, that the four eyes principle does make a difference. However, for those small projects that have a single maintainer, that's not a realistic option. So if you have got a small project, peer review is probably not going to happen. If you have the capabilities to do so, it does something. So this is really a mitigation against the tech. Generally, minimizing code complexity, looking at all your dependency for bigger projects, for security relevant projects, and asking yourself, do you really need all those dependencies? Will do something in this part of a tech chain? And a documented reproducible procedure for creating binary blobs. Funnily enough, one of the commit messages from the attacker introducing those new change test files actually specified that they are now being uh, changed in the repository because they have been created with a reproducible script with a well set uh, random seed at the attacker's machine so that those binary blobs are now reproducible. It just turned out the attacker was lying in that commit message and they never followed up in adding the script that would then create those binary blobs. But the idea is absolutely sound. So if you have some test vectors, if you have some correct or incorrect test vectors, binary blobs in your repository, please create them using a script and commit that script to the repository so that others can see how that binary blob was committed. <laughs> Binary blobs themselves in open source repositories should ideally go away. It's a pipe dream, it won't happen soon. We have drivers, we have opaque blobs that we need for hardware to run. But as much as we can, please let's remove binary blobs from our repositories. And finally, this is the one where you got lucky. This is in the post-mortem, we would flag that as what went well. There was some monitoring in place and that monitoring was the trigger to actually catch that behavior. We should learn from that as well. Let's do some more monitoring of runtime behavior of our packages and flag any changes to that runtime behavior. We got lucky one time, but we can use that luck to uh, as a future mitigation. If you can, flag anything that changes from one release to the other. Maybe in contrast to some other suggestions, some other learnings from that case, we actually do not believe that breaking the first stage would be very easy. So something like forcing a real name ID policy or being generally suspicious of any new contributors is, we believe, not in the best interest of most open source projects. So I, we also, if the assumption is correct that there was some national security service behind this kind of attack and the organizational complexity and professionalism of the attack points towards that, those attackers would actually not have had a hard time in getting a fake real ID that would be in all the right databases and would fool, the, would fool those real name checks. So we believe that this attack would not have been thwarted by real name checks and we believe that it would actually hurt uh, many of those open source projects. But this is certainly up for debate. And with that, um, I would just like to point out there's some more detail than we could then what we could fit in this talk in the archive paper that we uploaded a while ago. Um, and we are very happy to take any questions you may have at this point. Thanks you so much. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Yes, please. So we, we didn't, we saw that other people did an analysis, a time zone analysis Can of the, the oh, sorry, the question was, I forgot to repeat, the question was, did we notice any issues with the time zones of commits of the attackers? And yes, this analysis was done. Uh, not, we don't take credit for that. Other people did that. We just read what uh, was analyzed. And yes, there was nice time zone analysis that points to a region in, uh, I would say, slightly east from where we are right now. There is no clear indication, but if we assume the attackers keep to a nice um, like eight to five working habit and most of those commits actually came from that, then it points to that time zone. But this is just one indication and attribution is hard. I try not to 
read too much into that because the professionalism with which those attackers acted could very much mean that they pulled odd hours from where they actually live to, to point towards that. So the IP addresses fairly consistently came seemingly from Singapore. They used a VPN. Um, the name points to, you could say, Chinese origin. The time zone points to somewhere slightly closer to here at the moment. There are conflicting signals. And this is why we haven't even tried to do any attribution uh, besides the very strong suspicion, which is uh, backed by multiple signals, that this was a very professionally run operation probably not a single person, but a, a team that is well organized and uh, well practiced in operational security. Yes, please. So the question is, uh, do we have tools for automated analysis of, let's say, GitHub uh, commits or GitHub yeah. source? <laughs> there are tools and I mean, fuzzing is one tool that, it's, that could be used. We don't know if it would, uh, would have helped there. Are there tools to analyze automatically what the very great open source community has been doing over the last couple of months in pulling out all those bits and pieces uh, of how that attack chain worked? I don't believe so. Are there good tools that would decode those shell scripts for you um, that would point out that this could be malicious? Not really. This, this is why uh, one of the... One of my or our main takeaways was the build systems have grown too complex. Our, the, the tooling for analyzing doesn't keep up with the complexity of the build systems that the attackers exploit. So let's make our build systems and maybe our languages easier again so that we can build tools that help us analyze. But um, I, I think the, maybe I misunderstood. Oh, okay. So more detail than the question is, is there, yeah, it, it, is there tooling to better detect uh, potentially malicious signals in the commit history itself, not so much in the actual uh, what was committed? I'm not aware of any because I would say between different projects, in my experience, the, the style that people commit in differs a lot. So I... There was only the ready for commit by the GitHub action, right? So the point. There was only maybe the, the, there was a GitHub action available on a repository that verified, so systematically verified if the, the pull request owner is really the primary contact uh, or the maintainer of the specific repository or at least somewhere in a configuration file mentioned. And if this maintainer has previous commits on this uh, open source repository. And if there are some requirements fulfilled, then the automatic verification by the GitHub action um, showed that this commit uh, is ready for merge. But finally, the, the merge in this case, in this particular case, was done by a human after verifying. But it, but it, um, such this, when the system suggests a human that something is ready with a green check mark and everything is fine, I guess there is a small burden that the human then really merges this one. So maybe we could improve that if that one fits to your question, probably. And, yeah? uh, and interestingly enough, that tooling of marking something as ready for merge based on some of the signals in the commit history was actually exploited by the attacker. Mm -hmm. Because they changed that one signal of making themselves point of contact in the OSS fuzzer and exploited the tooling that that project put into place to help maintainers maybe spot something going on. So uh, I think my final answer is here. No, I don't think we have tooling to help us spot anything potentially malicious in a commit history going on. Because projects are so diverse and uh, even as humans, I don't think w without the getting lucky part of noticing there's something strange going on and then people starting to dig with this suspicion already in mind, I'm not sure anybody would have spotted that on human review.
So I'm uh, trying to s summarize the, um, uh, the the question, which was more um, uh, slightly more involved, as should distributors or the downstream of Linux distributors maybe take more care, do more review before integrating some of those uploads. And I mean, ideally, yes, if you have all the person power to do that, that would be ideal to double check all those changes coming into a distribution. But with the velocity of changes coming in, uh, I don't think it's gonna happen. And this was again, something that was exploited by the attacker for the Debian case that the, um, t the normal Debian maintainer, Debian developer, Debian maintainer, who took care of that XSET utils and the bells at the Maypack, um, also didn't keep up with the changes, and this is why they pressured somebody else to do what's in Debian terminology called an NMU, NMU a non-maintainer upload. So somebody who is not the upstream maintainer and not the typical Debian uh, maintainer or Debian de developer has stepped up to do the upload upon, again, social pressure not towards the original project, but social pressure towards the Debian developers to do that. Um, in, with that wording, hey, why do we have a like philosophical debate about when NMUs are um, appropriate and when, when not just do it because we need this bug fix. And pretty soon after that, it was actually done. Somebody uploaded that package. Ideally, yes, we should look at that, but do we have the person power to, to actually look at all those changes? I, I don't believe we do. We need better tooling for that. You could also say that we should maybe have better build infrastructure. And this is why I'm pointing to that. I think one of the most effective hammers, one of the most effective mitigations that we have at this point is to improve our build systems, make our build systems safer in, in being less complex, being reproducible, um, and being declarative, not to allow an attacker, not to allow an arbitrary project to remote to do remote code execution on our distributors' build infrastructure would be a nice step forward. I would I would suggest and um, help mitigate those bugs. Now, this is already ongoing. Debian, for example, has had the reproducibility project for a long time, and many of Debian packages are reproducible reproducible within Debian. If we can extend that to other uh, distributions, that would also have been caught much earlier. In fact, uh, so another small tidbit in those attacker scripts that we haven't uh, mentioned so far is they actually check at the uh, configure make stage that it is being executed on a Debian or um, Red Hat style packaging system. It deactivates itself on any other distributions. It didn't activate on Arch or Gen2 or some of the others because it was probably just properly tested for the main server architectures on Debian and Red Hat-ish systems. So the, the attacker also attacked specifically those distributions. They were aware of those distributions procedures on how they take uploads and how they ingest source code and attacked specifically that. If we had more reproducibility among different distributions, that would make an attacker's life even harder, a lot harder, I would say. Just repeating the comment, uh, better commit messages would help. Would better commit messages definitely help in trying to figure out what's ongoing in a project and uh, maybe distribution reviewers to take care of what is being changed. If the attacker lies in their commit messages and they make actually make sense at face value, like, hey, I'm changing those um, binary blobs because I've now I now I'm now creating them reproducibly then the comment message can also be very misleading. So I, I fully agree with you. Better comment messages would be nice. And we, nobody in here likes writing comment messages, me very, uh, very much included. But it would, it would help in the review process. Fully agreed. Yes, please.
mentioned that it's a likely non-solution non to, to add a real name and get new text. Um, but just from the perspective of the, for example, the Cyber Resilience Act of the European Union, it becomes more, more of a, an issue um, how the entire responsibility is, is delegated or delegated or completed. Um, considering this point, So, uh, about the last point about real name checks, the, uh, the comment in question is, uh, in light of upcoming regulation, like for example, the EU Cyber Resilience Act, don't we have to do that anyways? I hope I'm uh, paraphrasing correctly. Uh, yes, fully agreed. There is some projects, because of regulation, may have to do real name checks anyways. You may have to collect the identities and keep a track record of where changes came from anyways. I mean, if anybody is working on a, let's say, CC, EL, et cetera, certified product, then you have to do that anyways. You have to have a keep uh, a track record of every source line where it came from. Um, it, it makes an attacker's life harder. We still argue that in this particular case, we, we believe it wouldn't have helped because those attackers that we suspect being behind this kind of attack, they would have been able to produce real ID documents. As real as anybody who does this real name check for an open source project would be able to verify it. So in this particular case, would it uh, prevent some other attacks? Maybe, probably. It probably wouldn't have helped in this one. So it, yeah, it's an additional bar. Is it a bar that's worth it, that's an open discussion to have. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, just to, to wrap up on the final goals uh, of this attack that we have we, we put in there that uh, the goal might have been to inject a backdoor. But is there any means of the damage control side that they have any further goal? I mean, that this is working maybe because that's the first stage of, uh, of a very long planned attack, I mean, uh, along 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. So is there in any action on the damage control side uh, possible to take or, or has been taken in, in this particular case? So question here, do we know what would have been the future plans? What, where would it have ended up in? Because this is just the first stage that we caught injecting a backdoor in OpenSSH. What would have been the, the real goal of the attackers in the end? And I think the, the only honest answer is we don't know. I mean, having, having a backdoor into OpenSSH servers in the wild is a very powerful primitive. And it did make it into, uh, I think, some Fedora unstable, and it did make it into Debian unstable before it was actually caught. It was caught very early on. We got extremely lucky in this case, but it did make it into servers. So my only recommendation that I can give here is, if you had a Debian Fedora unstable server being reachable on the SSH port from the open internet anywhere during the time window while this was already uh, in the Debian package, the uh, libelsetma 5 package in Debian or Fedora. And um, before it was caught, like wipe that server. You, we have no idea what the attacker could have done with that primitive already with access to those open SSH servers as root. Um, assume that anything on those servers that have been exposed in that time window is compromised, has been leaked. Um, rotate all the keys that were on there, wipe everything that was on there. It's the only, the only reasonable answer for that. What would, the, what would the attacker have done afterwards? No idea. There is only the signal, the suspicion that the complex build injection infrastructure that was set up with those files that was already prepared for extensibility, for hooking into the future, for adding additional text files, for more additional, um, um, you could say, backdoor payloads to be delivered through the libelsetma library in the future. 
To the best of our knowledge, that didn't actually happen. We caught the first attempt using this infrastructure, but did we get aware of any other packages that have been trojanized with similar techniques? Probably not. We have to assume that this campaign is still ongoing and that we haven't caught the others yet. Yes. Um, thank you very much for that additional comment, the add-on uh, pointing to air-gapped systems. Uh, I believe that particular attack vector would not have impacted air-gapped OpenSSH servers because the way that, that we know about this attack required the attacker to submit commands with um, their signature to those infected servers to do something with them. So an air-gapped OpenSSH server would probably have been out of reach of the attacker. However, I'm already concerned that part of this attack stage was already a shell remote code execution on the build host. We believe that this was not used to attack the potentially air-gapped build systems that have the signing keys of the various Linux distributions on them to sign the packages, but it could have. So even an air-gapped build infrastructure that keeps their signing keys away from any internet connectivity, but that has a, let's say, one-way data pipe to ingest updates from the source repositories into the build host, and then another one-way pipe to get the signed uh, build packages onto the wider internet, but that itself is not reachable or not connected, would have fallen in this attack chain if the attacker had used their a remote code shell execution capability to exfiltrate something from the build host by, for example, um, if they are very well aware of how the Debian or uh, Fedora Red Hat build infrastructure works, to try and grab hold of the private signing keys from that air gap system and obfuscate, hide it into the libLZMA and therefore exfiltrate the signing key through the package. That would have been perfectly um, workable in this attack chain. To the best of our knowledge, it hasn't happened, so we believe air-gapped systems were not impacted and are safe for this particular attack chain, and that's all the um, detail that I'm prepared to say here because I don't know any better. Happy to. Yes, please. Sorry, I, I acoustically. Uh, yeah, so um, the, the question is NixOS. How, how do we, does something like NixOS, um, is that a solution here? We actually use NixOS in our own. Uh, build infrastructure for our research group, for some of the research projects that we do in Rust, by the way, because we try to do what we preach. Um, we believe Nix has some very favorable properties, and I would consider it nearly a safe build system in those definitions here. It's not perfect yet. We have some nitpicks that we are trying to improve with Nix, particularly when it comes to the hermetic isolation properties and um, how we build a full trust chain among all the dependencies. So Nix is going quite uh, a far uh, way to integrate the various different build systems and compilers and languages into one uh, build infrastructure that's kind of consistent. Um, it, if Nix was used to build that, that attack path that we see here would have broken or it wouldn't have uh, worked directly on Nix in this case, but it probably could have been adapted to work on Nix in its current form. There are some things that we can improve with Nix in particular that would be quite an improvement, yeah. 
Okay, and this is the stop signal for us because we've actually moved way into the luckily extended uh, first break. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks for all those interesting additional remarks and questions and enjoy the rest of the symposium in Vienna. Thanks a lot.